Hello, and welcome to your most obedient and humble servant. This is a women's history podcast where we showcase 18th and early 19th century women's letters that don't get as much attention as we think they should. I'm your host, Catherine Garrett. This week, I am very excited to introduce you to a special guest. This is Dr. Jim Ambeski. Jim is the current digital historian at Mount Vernon, and he hosts the podcast Conversations at the Washington Library. Uh, he was good enough to have me as a guest on his podcast, and he contacted me with this letter, so that was pretty exciting. <laughs> We're going a little bit outside of my wheelhouse for this episode and talking a little bit about 18th century Scottish history, which I am very excited to dig into. And it was the subject of Jim's doctoral thesis. So this is somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, so Jim, hi. Hi there. <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about your work as a digital historian at Mount Vernon. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks. Uh, first of all, Catherine, for having me. I'm delighted to be on the show and I'm very excited to talk about uh, my work at Mount Vernon and also uh, uh, about the topic of today's podcast, Flora McDonald. And as to what I do at Mount Vernon uh, as the digital historian, so I, I lead the Center for Digital History. And so it really that takes two facets. One is a, a kind of a public history angle, you might say. So as you said, I am the, the host of Conversations at the Washington Library. It's a weekly show where I talk to folks uh, such as yourself, actually. You were a recent guest. So I was really delighted to have. And It was lovely to be on. <laughs> well, great. I'm, I'm, you know, sometimes you never know how it goes. <laughs> and you're just sort of like, well, we did it. Let's put it out there. Um, and so, yeah, you'll be part of our upcoming season five, which actually should debut this week, this week being uh, the second week of September. And so we're very excited to bring that back. And and uh, and folks will be able to hear uh, your thoughts about this show and your work at the Washington or at the papers of George Washington soon. So, I do that. Um, I also produce and occasionally co-host our digital live streams. And so, since we've been in quarantine and the library uh, was closed to the public, therefore we couldn't have our digital or we couldn't have our in-person talks. We switched to a digital format. So, been very fortunate to interview folks like Serena Zabin and Vincent Brown and talk about some really exciting books that have come out recently. And then there's the other the other aspect of my work is is trying to create resources or possibilities for research using digital means. And so a lot of what I do is working with or building databases uh, or trying to uh, uh, refurbish them. And I also edit the Encyclopedia of George Washington. We have at the library, it is a digital product. We work with scholars, we work with other historians, we work with librarians, we work with students actually at universities to write encyclopedia entries on a variety of topics that speak to George Washington and the early American world in which he lived. Uh, so it's a very public facing role. It's a very uh, exciting, uh, role and uh, and I get to do a little bit of everything, so I get pulled in several different directions. So it's it's actually kind of nice to be here today, so I can talk about my research. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask. So you're currently working on a book yourself, right? Yeah. Well, trying to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly but surely. <laughs> well, tell me about that. So I uh, I'm writing a book about immigration from Scotland during the revolutionary period. That's when or that is what I wrote my dissertation on. I'm really interested in this mass movement of Scots out of the highlands and lowlands and the islands uh in the period between really the the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763 and the eve of the American Revolution uh, into 1775 actually when the war starts. Mm -hmm. It's a, a way, I think, uh, it's a different way to look at what we often call the imperial crisis, uh, sort of the dispute between the patriot Americans and the British over British authority. That's a sort of simple uh, oppositional way to look at it, but this is really an empire that's in crisis itself, and there are, there are multiple constituent parts of this empire of which Scotland plays a critical role. Uh, since uh, since it joined with England to create Great Britain in 1707. Um, the Scots, in a lot of ways, are the agents of empire. They are, and also they are, they are the architects of the empire. And they, they have a lot to lose uh, if the empire comes apart, at least they believe so. Uh, mm -hmm. But they also have a lot to lose, at least some people think in Scotland, they, they think they have a lot to lose if a lot of people are fleeing Scotland mm -hmm. uh, to the American colonies right at the wrong time. It, is this like the exact era that the show that like... That Outlander. <laughs> the Outlander is? <laughs> um, anyway, I was like... Well, no, but it, it is. This is a period of uh, a fundamental change. And actually, we'll get to some of that, I think, when we talk about the letter in a little bit. But this, as much as this is 
an era in which British America itself is transforming, so is Scotland. And there is there's a deep connections between the two and they're influencing each other in ways that uh, some people think is great and some people think is really terrible. It, it's all part of this process of people trying to decide what they want the empire to be and what they wanted to do for them, both individually, but also as a collective British people. So, so what sparked your interest in this? Why, why did you decide to focus on this? It was kind of by accident. Um, so to make a long story short, my, my wife actually has a PhD in history. She studies uh, gender and treason under the reign of Henry VIII. Hmm. And in 2008, when she was going for her first big research trip, I went along for a week. And so we, we kind of had actually a pre-honeymoon because we were, we were going to get married later that year when she got back. So we went to England and then eventually went to Scotland because I always wanted to go to Scotland. And we went to the castle in Edinburgh. Hmm. And during the tour down in the dungeon, uh, we learned that some American sailors who had been captured during the Revolutionary War had been imprisoned in that castle. And on the door to one of the um, holding cells, uh, some Americans had carved a nascent stars and stripes. So I thought, you know, I, I do want to go back to uh, graduate school. That's pretty cool. I wonder if I can find information about that. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of source material, um, mm. which uh, if you don't have that, you really can't do much with it. So, But over the course of actually doing so, I came across a man named John Witherspoon, who uh, many listeners might recognize as the one-time president of the College of New Jersey, which becomes Princeton. He was a radical uh, Presbyterian minister in a lot of ways. Uh, he immigrated in 1768 to assume the presidency of Princeton after a lot of cajoling from people like Benjamin Rush. And uh, uh, while he's in America, uh, he begins to actively promote immigration from Scotland, encouraging his countrymen to come resettle in the colonies. And uh, there was some pushback from that in a lot of, of newspapers, you know, accusing him of being an enemy to his country for seducing Scots uh, to leave Scotland where they could be productive and then go to America. Uh, where they might do something else. And so that that was kind of my start. I was really interested in that question. A lot of a lot of historians have looked at immigration from sort of the social aspect, looking at it from you know community dynamics and community networks. And I'm very much interested in that too, but I'm really interested in the political aspect. And I'm really curious about how people like Witherspoon, uh, elites in Scotland, like Henry Dundas, who was the Lord Advocate, how they are trying to understand and interpret this mass movement of people through the lens of what they see as a fracturing or potentially fracturing empire uh, in this period. So I was off to the races, off to Edinburgh several times and Glasgow as well and other places to to find find documents. I thought you were going to say when you're talking about your pre-honeymoon that you wandered off and you touched a magical rock. And you went exactly. back in time. <laughs> exactly. I climbed Arthur's seat and suddenly the voices spoke to me. Uh, and <laughs> but, but I mean, it's kind of actually, that's not far off. I mean, you climb Arthur's seat at the right time of day when the daylight hits yeah. and the sun's going down and it's, it's, it's pretty magical. So uh, in a way, yes, that actually, that did happen too. <laughs> Um, so this, this particular letter, how does, how did this come up in your research and how does it tie into what you're working on? Um, in a lot of ways, I actually got pretty lucky because the, the letter that we're talking about is from Flora McDonald uh, to a man named John McKenzie of Delvine. It was actually already online and transcribed. And, and the reason why is because immigration uh, plays a very powerful role in Scotland's national memory. Uh, there's this thing that they call the Scottish diaspora. Uh, and, you know, some of them joke that, you know, it's like uh, Scotland's such a great place. Why, why can't they keep anybody? And, and so over the centuries, there has been a, a great deal of movement from Scotland to other places, particularly in the empire in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, and it's particularly notorious in the 19th century when there's this thing called the clearances, where instead of people sort of making the choice themselves to leave, uh, like many of the people in my story, they're being actively pushed and cleared off the land and replaced with sheep. Uh, which is a, a much more productive thing, at least for the landowners in that period. So the immigration, this diaspora, plays a very powerful role in Scottish national consciousness. And so at the National Library of Scotland, uh, they have uh, several databases, but also they've, they've made an effort 
to uh, digitize and transcribe some of the important letters from each of these periods. And Floor McDonald's letter was one of them. So in that sense, I got lucky. Uh, I knew it was already there, but I did actually, you know, go and look at it myself. Um, this is in the era before uh, you could take pictures in the National Library of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And of course, after my last trip there, they started letting you do that. So thank you guys. I love you, but that would have been helpful when I was there. Um, but it was significant though, that this letter was in, in the papers of the McKinsey's of Delvine, because the man she's writing to is a lawyer. He's what's called a writer to the signet, uh, which is uh, the equivalent of an English solicitor. Uh, these are lawyers who can prepare writs, they can prepare other legal documents uh, on behalf of their clients. And many of the individuals in my project are lawyers. Uh, what, I, what I came to realize over the last few years as I worked on other things related to this is the centrality of lawyers in the story and how important it is that many of the major figures who are trying to quote unquote combat immigration and stop it from becoming an imperial problem are lawyers in Edinburgh where they were wielding enormous power. And so in McKenzie of Delvine, this particular iteration of him, because there's, you know, Scotland, so they there's like 12 of the same uh, people of the same name. Um, he, he is writing to various people like the McDonald's or like, uh, like the Countess of Sutherland's tutors, uh, basically her estate trustees who are dealing with a similar problem. And so he's kind of a, a nexus in a lot of ways of activity where people are reporting on some of the issues that a lot of people are facing. And, and Flora, tell me a little bit more about her. Oh, she's great. Um, <laughs> Uh, Flora McDonald, a lot of people, he's speaking of Outlander, she does show up actually in, nice. uh, in one of the books. And I think she's a, she is a minor character in the, in the series. Uh, she's a very fascinating figure. And she, if you look at some of the paintings of her by Alan Ramsey, and there's uh, some in the National Portrait Gallery of Scotland, and it's very clear that she's a very uh, assertive and very confident figure. And I, you know, I think that often comes through in, in a lot of her work and a lot in the, the histories about her. Um, you know, she stares at you with these fierce eyes, and and you know that uh, you know she kind of means business, which is which is terrific. She is born in the early 18th century in on the an island called the South Uist, which is in the Outer Hebrides, which is sort of the the big island chains that are on the western coast of Scotland. And she's born into a family which is a, a, a member of the minor gentry, essentially. Uh, she occupies, or her family occupies, kind of a middle rung of Scottish landed society. Um, you know, the, if you think of the clan chief or the, or the laird, or, or in, in a sense, the landlord at the top, uh, the minor gentry in the middle, and then the tenantry at the okay. bottom. And so she's, she and her family are kind of in between. And she actually becomes kind of a minor celebrity in the 1740s and, and a celebrity status that, that persists, at least in Scotland, through the 18th century. She, when she actually helps conceal Charles Edward Stuart, who many of your listeners will better know as Bonnie Prince Charlie, following his escape from the Battle of Culloden in 1746. Um, you know, Prince Charlie was the son of the man who would have been King James III had the Stuarts managed to reclaim the British throne earlier in that century. But of course, you know, we get the German speaking George, who is the Elector of Hanover. He becomes George I of Great Britain in 1714. And that doesn't really sit well with a lot of Scots, uh, but, but not an inconsiderate amount of Englishmen either. And, and these people become known as Jacobites, people who support James I, you know, after Jacobus for Latin for James. And so there's a there's an uprising in 1715, there's a, an attempt in 1719, and then there's the, the massive one, which really threatens the stability of Great Britain in 1745. Um, this is when Bonnie Prince Charlie comes from France, uh, he rallies men to his standard, uh, he begins winning a number of stunning victories, and actually gets pretty close to London before, before English forces uh, begin to push him back, and they are eventually crushed in uh, June of 46 at the Battle of Culloden, which is just outside Inverness, which uh, if you ever get a chance to go, it's, it's you know, speaking of magical, and it's, it, it really is. But then also you find yourself remembering that this is a place of great slaughter. And so how could two, you know, how could a place of such beauty coexist with what you know happened there? Uh, and it does. But it, so it invites reflection in there. And it's, a, it's a, a powerful moment in which the British government finally puts an end to Jacobite threats uh, mm -hmm. to the Hanoverian line. Bonnie Prince Charlie manages to escape. He manages to start slinking away to the outer islands. In the process, actually, uh, young Flora MacDonald actually helps conceal him 
for a time he is he's dressed up uh, in, in women's clothing actually as an Irish maid named Betty Burke. He actually manages to get away, get out of Scotland, get back to France and avoid capture. Uh, Flora is not so lucky. Uh, she actually gets uh, arrested along with her uh, soon-to-be father-in-law, a man uh, named Macdonald of Kingsburg. She's actually held in the Tower of London for a little oh bit. Uh, I know, right? And it's like they still did that at that point. Uh, it seems very Elizabethan, but she's put in the Tower of London for a time. She's eventually allowed to live in London on a kind of house arrest. And she actually has some supporters in the, in the, in the form of uh, the Prince of Wales, Frederick, who is George III's father who would have been king had he not died at a young age. And eventually she's pardoned as part of an amnesty act in 1747. She goes back to the Isle of Skye, which is a site of delicious whiskey, if if anyone is interested. She marries a man named Alan MacDonald, who is heir to the Kingsburg estate on Skye. It's one of the largest land estates on Skye. And Alan was a captain of the British army. He serves in the Seven Years' War. Uh, He's, you know, as I said earlier, part of this minor gentry as well where he is uh, sort of sandwiched in between his clan chief and, uh, and the tenantry. And so he, he saw what's called a taxman, which is a fun term. Um, it's essentially a means is that there's a deal between this minor gentry figure and his clan chief that this taxman gets attacked or the right to rent out and control land uh, in exchange for managing that land on essentially on behalf of the clan chief or the, or the laird. And that's where we find her in about 1772 when she writes this letter. She's sort of famous in her own right, which is why a lot of her letters have been saved. Yeah, I think so. Certainly, yeah. And people recognize, you know, her her status. I mean, uh, in the 1773, when James Boswell, the famous author, and Samuel Johnson, the famous English author, do their famous tour of the Outer Islands in the Highlands, uh, they go and visit her. And they, Johnson writes of her as kind of, almost kind of reverentially. Um, you know, he recognizes that that she commands a kind of um, status and aura. He's kind of, you know, very taken by her. Uh, as I said, you know, if you look at her portraits, you know, it's clear that she'll be in charge if she wants to be. Um, there's, there's no, there's no getting around that. That comes through clearly uh, in a lot of the material. I think it comes through clearly in this letter for sure, even. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very good, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think that sets up the context. And now we'll dig right into the letter. All right. Um, so this is the National Library of Scotland. This is Flora MacDonald to John Mackenzie of Delvine, 12 August, 1772, written at Kingsburg on the Isle of Skye. Dear sir, this goes by my son Johnny, who, thank God, though I am misfortunate, other respects is happy in his having so good a friend as you are to take him under his protection he seemed when here to be a good-natured biteable boy without any kind of vice make of him what you please as the blessing of the almighty attend you along with him which is all the return i am able to make for your many and repeated friendships shown to me in this family of which there will be soon no remembrance in this poor miserable island The best of its inhabitants are making ready to follow their friends to America while they have anything to bring them. And among the next we are to go, especially as we cannot promise ourselves but poverty and oppression, having last spring and this time two years lost almost our whole stock of cattle and horses. We lost within these three years 327 heads, so that we have hardly what will pay our creditors, which are to let them have and begin the world anew in another corner of it. Alan was to write you, but he is not well with a pain in his side this 10 days past. Sir, I beg of you, if you see anything amiss in the boy's conduct, to let me know if it is as some children will stand in all of their parents more than anybody else. I am with my respects to you and Mrs. McKenzie, sir, with esteem, your most obedient, humble servant, Flora MacDonald. So in your own words, what is going on in this letter? Well, there's a lot of delicious things going on here, and it really speaks to the broader context of what's happening in Scotland and the empire, but also for them personally. Um, You know, as I think actually, when we talked, when you were on uh, my show, we, you know, we talked about sort of the format of the letter, and it sort of makes this nice sandwich. And so there's the, you know, the introduction that's about her son, Johnny, who is in Edinburgh, and he's in high school, and John Mackenzie of Delvine is, is kind of watching over him and making sure he's behaving himself. Johnny actually goes on to a pretty successful career in British India. It turns out to be pretty helpful in his parent, to his parents later in life. And so one aspect is she's, 
she it indicates that they, that that they have a relationship that puts uh, that where she feels comfortable putting John under his tutelage. There's uh, you know it very makes very clear that they have had a long standing personal but also you know probably professional relationship. Given that John McKenzie of Delvine is a lawyer, uh, but really the the meat and potatoes of this is she's talking about what's happening in Sky and what's happening more broadly both in Scotland. So there's a few things that we see happening here. Um, she's talking about all of her friends and including possibly them going to America. This is 1772. This is at the moment when there are many people leaving from the outer islands. Uh, and they're doing so for a few reasons. One are sort of short-term changes in Scottish society, but also uh, some long-term changes. To make a long story short, what is happening is that uh, since the 17th century, what we think of as the traditional Scottish clan is breaking down. It's, it's fracturing. The, the clans are traditionally thought of as a, a reciprocal relationship between the clan chief and his people. And so thinking about it as a kind of feudal relationship, um, you know, you give me military service, I promise you protection and whatnot. Well, in, for a variety of reasons, in part because Scotland is in a union with England and because Scots are much more engaged in the empire, that begins breaking down. Clan chiefs actually begin to act much more like landlords than they do clan chiefs. And so they're, they're much more concerned uh, with things like rental income, you know, shoring up their finances. Uh, a lot of them are spending a lot more time in Edinburgh, but more importantly in London, spending beyond their means. And so as a consequence of that, they're jacking up rent rates on their tenants. And that's, that's putting people in a very difficult position. And that, while that's also happening, that middle part of the gentry that we talked about, they're getting squeezed out. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of, of these clan chiefs turn landlords, they don't necessarily want to have to deal with the middlemen anymore. They're beginning to think that, uh, well, uh, maybe we can deal directly with tenants. And that's not to say that this is happening all at once. Actually, it's a process that takes a long time. But but people like the McDonald's are a lot, under a lot of pressure because they feel that they're losing their status uh, mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're losing their position in Scotland. Now, fortunately, for a lot of Scots in this position uh, who, are, who are laboring under economic hardship because of jacked up rent rates or they feel besmirched because their, their position in society is waning, they are uh, making ready to follow their friends to America. And this is great for them because this is another British place that they can go to. This is a place where they can still be subjects of the king. They can still participate in the bounty of the empire, but they don't have to deal with landlords anymore. And they might actually become landlord landowners in their own right. And so mm -hmm. that's very appealing to a lot of people, both in the tenantry class, but also people like the McDonald's who are, who are getting squeezed out. Well, uh, I was going to ask when she talks about poverty and oppression, mm -hmm. who, who does she see as oppressing her? Well, in part, uh, the oppression is coming from those clan chiefs. I mean, Alan at this point and Flora right. are in a quarrel with their clan chief over, over these very issues. And so you begin to see that middle gentry talk about clan chiefs as oppressing them, but also the, the tenantry as well. I mean, they see rent rates going up as a form of oppression which they cannot financially afford. But the poverty also comes from the fact that she's talking about the loss of all their stock of cattle, what compounds all of this right. in the 1770s, particularly in 72, in you know, 73, it happens again. There's a series of harsh winters that really hurt Scottish agriculture and animal husbandry, it kills a lot of cattle, which is a primary agricultural product. It makes it impossible, as, as Flora says here, to pay their creditors. If you can't get those cattle to market because they're all dead, um, yeah. you you can't pay your creditors, and then you and then you know people who would depend on that cattle for food, you uh, you can't eat either. So there's a and this is happening elsewhere in the Highlands as well, up in the Northern Highlands and the Sutherland Estates. You know they say, they face the same issue, just very hard winters that uh, compromise agricultural productivity. And she mentions. Um... She'll pay what her creditors what she can and begin the world again anew in another corner of it, which I just thought was a nice poetic little line there. I know I love it too, and it's just, it's a theme you see recurring in a lot of these letters from Scots who are preparing to go to America, or you know, or Scots who are already in America, and they're encouraging their friends and family to come over. Uh, you know, they, they say you can start over again. You have the possibility, as I said, of acquiring land on yourself. You know, people are recommending which colonies will probably give you the cheapest land and where where you can get it. You know, the McDonald's end up going to North Carolina. 
because a lot of, of islanders uh, actually end up going there. There's a, there's a kith and kin network that, uh, that's in operation there too. And so people are going where their friends and family are encouraging them to. So it's a very real theme. Um, and, and one of the, the points I, I think is important to make is that, you know, one time I, I was telling somebody about my project, uh, it was a public audience. And uh, so I was saying, you know, they have a lot of Scots in the 1770s were wanting to go to America. And they, one person said, because they wanted freedom. And it's like, no, you can't read the American Revolution back onto this. With, they, wanted, they wanted to be British. Uh, they very much believe that um, because the king had his dominions in America, they had a decent shot of rebuilding their lives in this place. This isn't a group of people, for the most part, who are really looking to upend the imperial order. They're using it to their advantage to accomplish their objectives and, and, and to pursue uh, a better lives for themselves. Two years after she writes this letter, uh, she and Alan and their family go to Anson County, North Carolina. They, they show up right at the wrong time because, of course, the next year the war breaks out. Right. Uh, the American Revolution, the, what becomes the War for Independence. And the McDonald's remain loyal to the crown. Uh, so it, which oh, is no. fascinating, it's fascinating, right? Because this is, this is her second rebellion against British authority in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, she's participant in the Jacobite rebellion, but, but here, interestingly enough, like many former Jacobites, they do remain loyal to the King in this war. Um, so the war breaks out. Allen uh, raises a militia company of loyalists to fight in defense of the King's authority. He eventually becomes part of a British regiment uh, and he's uh, captured at the Battle of Morris Creek Bridge in February 1776. Mm -hmm. um, and this was um, a kind of uh, a moment that takes the wind out of the sails of a lot of loyalists and British hope for loyalists in their cause at this point, because there's so many Scots in North Carolina, and a lot of them rallied to the King's standard. And then uh, the Patriot forces actually went a pretty important victory at this uh, Battle of Morris Creek Bridge that kind of takes the wind out of their sails. Allen is captured uh, by Patriots. He's eventually imprisoned in Philadelphia. He's released a few years later. And in the meantime, the North Carolina provincial government confiscates Flora McDonald's property and, and Allen's property, as so many, it happened to so many loyalists. They eventually both make their way to Nova Scotia uh, in the late 1770s, and Flora returns to Great Britain in 1779. And and eventually makes their way back to Skye. But, uh, you know, they're, for, for the rest of their lives, they still are dealing sort of with the consequences of the American Revolution and the financial fallout of the American Revolution. Right. Um, yeah, so it, it did not work out as they had planned or had hoped. I just think I, it's always interesting reading loyalist perspectives of the American Revolution. And somebody who had just moved to North Carolina from Scotland is not usually how you envision this, like in the American sort of mythos, like mm -hmm. haughty loyalist person, you know. Uh, so it's an interesting sort of face to that. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, and a lot of uh, a lot of times, too, you see a, a distinction between sort of Scots immigrants who, who immigrated in the early 18th century, and they they tended, to, uh, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them that sided with the the Patriot cause, in part because they had become sort of acclimated to American politics and sensibilities. But then a lot of the folks in my story who were leaving between the end of the Seven Years' War and the outbreak of the American Revolution, they, a lot of them stay loyal, despite yeah. the fact that a lot of these folks were former Jacobites. Uh, but they, they saw... As uh, you know, my colleague Matthew Dejik, who's at the Naval Academy, has written a really wonderful book of, uh, on the Highland Soldier in North mm -hmm. America during this period. And he argues pretty persuasively that the Scots, you know, were grateful that they had the opportunity, as I was saying earlier, to go to another place where they could, you know, enjoy the fruits of their labors. But um, you know, the uh, the American War for Independence caused a bit of a problem in that plan. <laughs> and I I like um, Andrew O'Shaughnessy's take on uh, the sort of English perspective of the American Revolution, which I was very convinced by the fact that so, a lot of English people really didn't think that it was as serious of a revolution as it was because the people who they're corresponding with, for the most part, are these loyalists. And so from somebody mm -hmm. like Flora's perspective or from somebody like some of these more recent immigrants who are writing back home to their families, they're like, oh, this, isn't, this is gonna blow over. We can make this work. Uh, and they don't necessarily see the level of... Uh, support that revolution actually had in different areas. No, it's it's a terrific example or a terrific point. And I see that too in a lot of the letters uh, that I work with. Um, there's a, a couple of brothers named uh, Donald and William McLeod uh, who were in Virginia and Maryland and they're riding back home to their family just outside of Glasgow. You know, they're, they're merchants in the tobacco trade and whatnot, which the Scots essentially control. 
in this period. And they're like, you know, um, if, if folks are thinking about coming, probably not a good time, but we're pretty sure that the King's troops are going to put down this rebellion and then, you know, the dispute will be over and it'll be hopefully fine. But there's, as you rightly say, there's this sense that we're going to take care of this pretty quickly and it's, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a problem, but uh, we, you know, we'll deal with it. We'll deal with it. There's a few upstarts, but yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is there anything that sort of struck you as really evocative that, or sort of relatable when you're reading the letter? Yeah, I think so. It, you know, it, I think anybody can relate to trying to figure out a, a way out of a desperate situation. And, uh, you know, I think too, I do often think about, you know, immigration in our own time, you know, especially in recent years, that's been uh, a significant part of our political landscape, thinking about legal or illegal immigration and, you know, building walls to keep people out. And, and when a lot of people are in the same position, you know, the, the McDonald's have, as I said, they're minor gentry. So they've got, they've got more money that, that, that they can probably tap into and they've got uh, familial and professional connections that they can leverage. But, you know, a lot of folks who are coming in the 70s, 60s and 1770s are kind of of that lower class who are looking uh, for a fresh start you know, a lot of the people trying to come into the United States the same way. But, but what's interesting here is that a lot of the part of my story that I tell is about how some of the landed elite and the political elite in Scotland are trying to keep people in. Um, hmm. You know, it's, it's a much different problem, political problem and legal problem when you can move about freely of the king's dominions, uh, when you are, in a sense, one political entity. But, you know, now, in our modern area, when we're talking about immigration, and we, when we're, we're talking about people moving from one sovereign country to another, uh, it's a whole different ball game. But in a lot of ways, the people who are experiencing it are, are going through the same things. Yeah. I personally like the sort of bookend segments about her son also as well. Just I like how she describes him as without any kind of vice. Uh, that's, yes. <laughs> I yeah. read a lot of letters from mothers that would not be so kind about their sons. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and, and I love the part too, where she's like, listen, we all know that children are going to behave in front of their parents, but the, the real test is when they're outside of their parents' eyes. And so let me know if he's screwing up. I, you know, I, I think about with that with my own kids and like, you know, because we always ask, you know, grandparents or when they go for a play date, like, did they behave well, you know? <laughs> Generally, you know, they're not going to try anything funny with mom and dad in the room, but, and she's doing the same thing. So I find that totally relatable as a parent. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, as much as I like, you know, the middle part of that letter where, where it's speaking directly to my project, like it, that, that part really appeals to me. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> just, just let me know if he's missing. Exactly. <laughs> I'll if, handle if he's, it. If he's being a jerk, I want to know about it. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. It's really fun to hear somebody who knows so much about a subject be able to talk about it. And this, you really uh, introduced me to some pretty cool stuff. Well, I'm, uh, I'm more than happy to. And uh, you know, it's, been, uh, it's been fun to talk about uh, the ghosts of projects past. <laughs> <It's> still, <laughs> it's not a nice way to put it because I'm writing a book about it. But um, you know, we talk a lot about Washington. So it kind of must, it's fun to get step away for a little bit, <laughs> yeah, talk about is. something else. Exactly. It's fun to take off the tri-corner hat, put on the <laughs> kilt, drink some whiskey, and uh, play some bagpipes. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, and for my listeners, as always, make sure you check for show notes. I will definitely share that portrait of Flora, uh, if I'm able to find that anywhere. And um, we can put some citations up. And as ever, I am, as Flora wrote so beautifully, your most obedient and humble servant. Thank you very much. Thank you.